and Morgan. And was that it? Yep. Okay. I haven't I haven't heard from um, John at all. I haven't either. We'll, we'll, wait, comes we'll, wait to, we'll wait just a little bit to see if John comes on. Yeah. I just need to leave it to 30 um, to go to another, uh, to go to a, a training that I'm facilitating. When you learn how to master by location, Carrie, will you share the secret for me? <laughs> yeah. I know there's some folks who they'll have like something going on on their like phone or tablet or then they'll have their computer. Then you just have to like master the art of muting. <laughs> right. well, da well, well, David, you got, you usually have two computers going on, don't you? Well, a, a couple of screens going and and uh, and I could use another one. Um, yeah, except I was I was complaining to Jordan yesterday that I keep losing my mouse, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with, the, with the extended desktop, it's like, where is it? So, so, you know, so I think that's, I think that's a problem that's ripe for a, a, a technology solution. Mm -hmm. Sounds, sounds like a, a new business uh, model for you, David. No, I'll have to mention it to Luke. So, <laughs> right. you, you know, a, lo a long time ago, um, when I think it was sort of like when Windows came out and when when Mac went to, um, you know, to the um, uh, or when Apple went to the Mac OS, there was a thing called Mouse Tails. Hmm. Does anybody remember those, Jordan? Yeah. I was just I was just as you were saying it, that was actually just popping in my head at the same time. Yeah, because it was I it, I mean, I was I was young at the time, uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know all the details. But yeah, you know, it'd follow you around like. That's, you know, I'm sure people can yeah. do a lot of um, modifications. And yeah, because because where it really gets, I mean, it gets lost with the arrow, but it also gets lost when it's like in the cursor um, mm -hmm. position and you just literally can't find it. And you're looking at, you know, square yards of LCD to try to figure <laughs> out where this thing is. Um, <laughs> oh, there's a right. So uh, all right, so let's let's uh, let's uh, get started here. Um, I want to call uh, to order the um, engagement work group of the Commission to Study uh, School Funding, uh, and in uh, compliance with uh, the executive order, uh, let's have a, a roll call of those of us that are here. Uh, this is Mel Myler calling in from Port Clyde, Maine. Corrine. Corrine Cascad in Berlin, New Hampshire. Uh, Susan. Susan Heward in Concord. And then we have uh, Chairman uh, Luno. Dave Luno here in Hopkinton with Ozzy the long haired dachshund. And we have uh, Commission Member uh, Dick Ames. Yes, I'm here in Jaffrey in my home. Then we have the Carsey uh, group here. Uh, uh, Carrie. Uh, Carrie Portree, Dover, New Hampshire, in my home alone. Uh, Jordan. Jordan Hensley, also in Dover. Uh, my fiance is in the other room and the other screen. Uh, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah Bogey, also in Dover, and uh, I'm the fiance in the other screen. <laughs> okay. uh, the first, the first thing we have to do is um, accept the uh, minutes of our October 22nd meeting. I'm open for uh, uh, a motion to move to accept those. Corrine will move. Uh -huh. Yep. Susan okay. seconds. Thank you. I have a roll call of those members who are on the committee. Uh, I vote aye. Corrine? Aye. Susan? Aye. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, if we look at um, our task for today, we've got a number of them. Uh, the, the main thing is to begin to look to review uh, some of the main themes that um, we've been looking at from a standpoint of the various inputs that we've had. Uh, and one of the things that I like to do as we do that, the first thing I like to do is kind of review the, um, the conversation that took place uh, both yesterday and uh, was it the day before that we had the, uh, uh, I was unable to be on the one yesterday, but let's start with the one uh, the day before that dealt with the municipal and um, 
the municipal and uh, folks that were that that was the this was the re the reinvite uh, to look at that. Uh, what were some of the things that uh, we saw from that that uh, and that caught our attention? I think for me, uh, listening to that conversation, it raised some of the issues that we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Um, I mean, the issue of um, one of the things that that I thought was impressed me was the comment from Bedford about the issue of um, the um, adequacy question of high performing schools versus low performing schools and not uh, wanting to lower their expectations for the state average, for example. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the issues that that we, we have to deal with coming forward. Corrine, you were, you were on that call, weren't you? What were some of the- Yeah, I'm looking at my notes. Um, there was some, somebody mentioned about, should the cost be the same for every student or they thought it should be for yeah. one set cost, but really it wasn't our place to start having a conversation about, well, you gotta understand that some kids cost more than others. Um, the other piece I had heard something about an implementation schedule over about five years. And that, that was the first time I had heard of that. Um, somebody was also in favor of school consolidations and really wanted that issue pushed more. Um, I don't know if I'm crossing over into yesterday's public comment now or not. No, I had different comments for that. Um, and I think that that was pretty much it. They, they did, didn't they also talk about the issue of the, I brought up the issue of the donor towns. I thought I heard that comment come out uh, from some of the folks too. Yeah, there was a fear of um, towns who can support um, education and pay, you know, have, have the resources. They didn't want to have to lose those resources okay. or give them up to another. Uh, and there was something on donor towns. Somebody spoke about donor towns that yeah. it should, they should be, yeah. you know, non-existent. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where a hold harmless um, agreement would have to be put in place, right? Yeah, something so like that. That towns yeah. would not be losing what they currently yeah. have. At least and that goes back to the issue of also some of the stuff that we talked about as far as phase in phase in programs for what we're what the fiscal actually was dealing with that somewhat uh, in the uh, in the earlier morning uh, meeting today. Oh, how okay. about how about last night? Uh, I was unable to I was in transition from Boston yeah. up here and was unable to listen to that. What happened last night in the, the session? Um, well, the, quite a few people spoke. Um, really, what I heard across the board is the speakers were really pushing the commission to really push the envelope to get something done and not just submit a report and sit back and wait. Um, I thought some of the speakers were quite strong in whatever is decided, go after it and push the legislation for it. Um, you know, we heard from NHASP, NHA, uh, NHSBA, uh, we heard from NEA. Um, I'm trying to think what else here. Um, I mean, again, that being bold and pushing the legislation to come to decisions was loud and clear from several of these groups. Um, and also the issue of revenue. Uh, there was one woman that talked about, well, you know, the state has to grapple at some point with figuring out how to generate more financial revenue for education, because we're dependent on a couple different things. And it's not really, it, I don't think it's sustainable, but she said, don't discount alternative revenue. And that when you talk about additional revenue, it's not popular at all. Um, in a lot of circles, but yet if you want a good product, you have to invest in that product. Um, don't do explicit. And they asked about an explicit statement for new revenue sources from the commission. That was a request. Um, 
they like the idea of a PowerPoint. Um, they somebody encouraged to share that commission work out with various uh, stakeholder groups. It was funny, you know, this morning I was talking to a sheriff in the neighborhood and he had no idea what the school funding commission was. And I thought, well, I know, I mean, yep. you know, you're in a political arena, somewhat in law enforcement and you don't know about it. I just can't imagine, you know, who does know about it. So I think the statements uh, of what the commission has done and is doing and, you know, for us to really come to consensus again on what do we actually believe is the right way to go to change this formula? And we're not all gonna agree, but we need to come to consensus. And that that's the message that I got more so from yesterday's group. Um, you know, people talked about making sure that we don't talk about uh, cat aid anymore because it's really special education aid. Um, somebody talked about meeting all the funding um, with the changes in New Hampshire retirement, special ed programming, unfunded mandates, and building aid is sort of just dangling out there. Um, I think that was pretty much it. I think uh, Barrett Christina, you know, called attention to RSA 189 colon one, which was the school board's authority to provide an adequate education. Um, so he did raise that question as well, or that statement, he brought that to our attention. Yeah, um, one, of the, one of the questions that I had is I, as I looked at the notes from that Jordan provided, and thank you, Jordan, for doing that. Oh, yeah, <clears> I, the, didn't even, I didn't even get to do that yet. <laughs> the question, the question that I that came up, what is the meaning of a bold change? I mean, that, I mean, people. Have, this is kind of a common thing that we have heard from a variety of different things. Of we have. What is bold? Uh, and I think um, I don't have an answer to that, but I think there. Because I think in in individuals' minds' eyes, the boldness will vary dependent upon their perspective on the issue. Uh, but I think um, David and I have talked briefly about this from the standpoint of well, what is what's bold? What would be bold? Um, and in some cases, I... bold is I think has a relatively scale to it, dependent upon your definition of bold. But uh, right. Um, so, I do envision when people talk about bold that we're not just going to take the current system and fluff it up a little bit. Okay, that's how I think that when people say take the chances and step out of the box, I think they mean to come up with somebody, something totally different. Um, and I also think that part of that bold statement is don't be afraid to say it's going to cost money. Yeah. So, so I think you know, in... In, you know, along with those comments um, from yesterday, and um, and there were uh, the the world the word bold was um, was you know pretty apparent in in a number <laughs> of them. I I think you know um, I think that could also reference back, and I think member all members of the commission have it is a. Um, uh, a memo on principles, and it was and Jeff McLynch uh, talked to it yesterday, uh, and, and during public comment. But he also provided a hard copy of it, and I think that could, uh, I think that does actually reflect um, what what they mean by bold. Um, Is that one of the documents on a, in our resources? Um, it, it, it's probably on, I know it, I'm sure it's on the web, but I think it was sent along to everybody too. Uh, yeah, I see what Jay's got. Yeah, I think I emailed it out to commission <laughs> members uh, yesterday. And then it's, it's also on the website under yesterday's uh, public comment uh, under the 1028 uh, oh, materials. Okay. I've included it there as well. So if that's easier to find. Yep. yep. Okay. Well, okay. All right, so one of our tasks today is to kind of begin to look at some of the themes that uh, we've been hearing about as we've, we've had this. So let's look at uh, let's look at some of those themes that uh, we think we've been hearing about anyway. 
Well, what I I took all of the groups in that big from that big spreadsheet that Carrie. Yeah, that's together. what I was looking at too. Yeah. And then I created my own table with like six, anywhere from five to six overarching points that seem to come out repeatedly from each of the groups. And now I'm just looking at it crossways, crosswise to see how the groups um, have, you know, some very similar themes. And the current system of inequity um, really is across almost every single group or it is across every single group, even the students. Um, so there is recognition, which is good, that the current system is not equitable. <clears throat> um, I also thought I heard the issue of the need for some property tax relief too. I was gonna say that's probably the, the biggest commonality uh, that seems to come out both in, I think in the public comment sections and um, yes, I would say there is definitely a need for the um, property tax, local, local property tax relief. Yeah. Um, Unfunded mandates was definitely something yeah. in several of the groups that was brought up. Is that, you know, districts are forced to pay for those mandates um, and the state doesn't increase its, its share when it requires things to be put in place. I thought that another thing that I saw too uh, was the, the role of SWEP and, and how that's used. Yeah. Can you say a little more about that, Mel? Well, I think there, there's a, there's a, <clears throat> yeah, there, to me, there was a number of issues. One, how it's used, um, how it's distributed. I just think there was a general concern about where that fits in to the general funding of, of, of schools. Um, mm -hmm. So it was more of a general comment than any, any specific thing, but a number of people have referenced that just how does it work? Can it work differently, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, there were, I thought also there was um, in a couple of looking at the crosswalk in a couple, and this may go back to Kareen, your comment about inequity, but there was a, quite, there was a question of, of disparity um, and disparity, both uh, from a um, tax standpoint and also from a racial standpoint, uh, particularly when you deal with, I think, with the student, uh, the student input, et cetera, uh, they were dominant on that. But I also picked that up from a number of different other people saying, uh, I would assume this is in reference to uh, the English language learners, folks, et cetera. But the issue that there, there was uh, the issue of poverty around the whole issue, uh, the disparity around poverty, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you talked about disparity too, I picked up a hint in not all the groups, but in one group on racial um, inequities. And um, I wish I, had the opportunity to, you know, question that a little bit more. What, what are they perceived? What are they perceiving to be the inequitable? Is it access to programs? Is it language barrier? Um, that kind of, I had an interest in that, just knowing, well, what is, because somebody did, and probably in the ed, ed leadership um, section, I don't know if I can find it now in this, scribbled so much over all my notes. Um, does anybody remember that conversation? 
Well, well, the, uh, another thing that I thought I, I heard too, uh, maybe, maybe it's just because of my own perceptual screen, but I did hear a lot of student-centered um, comments around money, that, that the funding should be focused on student needs. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting an interesting comment because we've been talking about that, but I mm -hmm. thought I pick I I picked that up in some of the comments from people around the issue of the need to be focused on what the student needs are around the state. Yeah, I, I you're right. I mean, I I picked up on that as well in my notes, um, and maybe it's because they really don't know the details of how money is allocated to districts but they did uh, recognize the differences between uh, the districts that have the resources and the districts that don't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another one I picked up that, that I'm not sure how it fits into the long-term issues here, but there was concern about how this pandemic has uh, impacted schools. And we, we've known that, we've heard that. But the question is, is how does that relate to the immediate kind of needs vis-a-vis -vis the long-term needs, which is one of the things that I think the commission is looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, to me, there's a question mark of how you deal with that. But I do think that's a common theme of people not understanding um, how that fits into, the, in, into their funding schemes. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other the other thought I, I, I heard too a couple of times was was how do you maintain the quality of staff, uh, and particularly instructional staff? Uh, that came out I thought in, in a number of different comments, uh, particularly in those areas from districts that have uh, are not do not have the ability to have the same kind of a salary structure, uh, and so the idea that you know. Teachers will come in, they'll be here for a couple of years and then they move next door and make additional. Yep. And so that the turnover of staff and how that impacts continuity of uh, program development. Yeah, and I, th I think somebody yesterday also brought up the issue of um, leadership turnover. Yep. And sometimes that makes a difference for sure. Um, and then the teacher quality course came out in the grant state polls, but yeah. it also um, retention of teachers yeah. was an issue in salaries, but um, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't cost, it doesn't cost the same to live in all parts of the state. I yeah. mean, it costs more in some regions, um, but yeah, it is, I mean, I, I know that, you know, Berlin was able to get a fairly solid salary schedule for a while and it really would frustrate all the little neighboring towns because they would all want to come for the bigger salary and they couldn't find people and they still have struggled finding teachers to fill positions. Um, I don't know if that's something that that would get resolved really. Um. So, so I have these uh, these seven items. One, the inequity. Yeah. Uh, tax relief at the local level. Yeah. Issue of unfunded mandates. Uh, teacher quality, leadership turnover. Uh, the role of SWEP. Uh, the issue of disparity dealing with both taxing poverty. Um, and, and racial issues, um, and the question of focusing on student need, uh, student-centered kinds of issues. Uh, that uh, those are the seven that I've identified that okay. we've talked yeah. about here. Yeah. Uh, how does that compare with your your list, uh, Corinne? Yeah, that's exactly what comes across my um, my cro my crosswalk that I put together from the bigger one. But I wonder. You know, and I guess I'd ask Susan, should we have a statement in regards to the revenue? Because I mean, what do you mean by that? Uh, like, should we be should we be deciding that 
we need to talk about, we need to have some sort of sustainable revenue uh, to be able to meet the students' needs, even if they aren't all the same. I, I don't know. I mean, revenue comes up. And it, I, I feel like it's an elephant on the table that nobody wants to talk about. You know, and one of the things too, I, I don't, I'm not sure whether, uh, I, didn't, I didn't pick this up in, in any of the conversations or the notes, but I'm not sure whether or not folks realize the amount of money that is currently being spent in our public schools. I think and you're I, right. <laughs> and as, and as, as we've, as of AIR pointed out, <clears throat> is that we are one of the highest, if you take all, everything together, yeah. we're one of the highest in the country that provides uh, funding for schools. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my sense is a lot of people don't realize that now. Right. You can debate that. Maybe that maybe we make a statement that, you know, the current revenues satisfies um, the current needs. I yeah. mean, it may not, it won't, you know, forever because it's going to have to go up, yeah. but um, then maybe that would put people's yeah. at ease on wow, are they secretly talking about this tax or that tax? Yeah. I think if we feel that the current distribute, the current funding does meet the needs and the issue is the re distribution, distribution of those dollars, yeah. then we should make that statement right yeah. off, yeah. right out of the gate because that's yeah. a big question. I think people are afraid, oh, they're gonna ask for an income tax. Oh, they're gonna ask for a sales tax or they're gonna ask for something. But if, if that statement can be made as one of the principles, um, then it puts people's mind at ease maybe, and it helps them recognize that the current dollars the state does generate, um, you know, satisfies the current student needs. It's, it's interesting because some of, the, uh, some of the negative comments about some of the work of the commission has been focused on the issue of taxation, et cetera. And yet, um, I don't think, David, Dave, I'm looking at your, your fiscal capacity um, work group. The issue of, tax, of additional taxes, I don't believe have really been a primary focus of the conversation. It has been on the issue, and I, I think AIR pointed it out. It's not a matter of how much, it's about how it's distributed. Right. And that's what's that's that's the that's the inequity right. around here, right? Am I I'm, am I correct, well, David? There, there's there's there, there's two inequities. There's there's um there's how much is um is is being uh, raised and appropriated in each district to um to um, meet student needs and uh, and achieve outcomes. And clearly, the um, when looking at the outcomes and looking at how much is spent by those specific districts. Um, it's you're, you're not getting the same just say it this way you're not getting the same product right. going to doing going to some towns that you'd get to get going to some districts that you'd get going to other districts mm -hmm. and um and and it's not just like a little bit of difference it's it's, it's a lot of difference the 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 spread is thousands. spread is four <laughs> orders i mean four standard deviations right. plus yeah, two to minus two. um so it's huge. Yeah. And, um, so that's the student inequity part. I believe the AIR estimated cost model um, shows how how there would be a recalculation of costs depending on the disparities and the unique characteristics that every every school district has, and um, and so you can you can see that that and you know and the, 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 this is talked about quite a bit we've talked about it this morning too you can see that that the cost of providing education uh for students in manchester is different than 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 the cost of providing education in in um in bedford um similarly um you can you can also see and iris raised this at an adequacy work group uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that uh, that she raised it as a question why is the cost of education, the, the estimated cost of education coming out of the AIR um, model, why is it higher in Waterville Valley than it is in Claremont? Mm -hmm. And it's because the estimated cost of education has nothing to do with the fiscal capacity of the towns that the district serve. It has to do with the unique characteristics of the students and the schools. Um, uh, 
not the fiscal capacity of the town. And, um, and, and, and so when you, when you then take a look at fiscal capacity and, and a, a town's ability um, to, to raise money, uh, that's where you, that's where the taxpayer inequities really, really, yeah. really factor in. Um, so, so there are, there are both, um, um, you know, both elements of, of inequity here. Uh, and, um, and I believe from all the, you know, things we've read, whether it's from Lincoln Institute, the AIR information, uh, and stuff that we've, we've talked about in the work groups, that um, that the that the solutions for both of those are um, are you, you don't necessarily um, solve both with the same solution. There's different approaches. Did, and and I, would it be all right if I asked Dick to sort of weigh in on on this because he's sure. been yeah, in yeah. One of these. yeah. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, and Mel, I agree with what all that Dave has just said and. Uh, Getting back to the original proposition that started this discussion that the current total amount of state funding uh, and the average that you get by dividing that total by all the students or by the different district spending levels is high and probably sufficient as a statewide perspective, but that that's not true if you go down to school districts and that's why we're here. That's why we're a commission working okay. on school funding because there's been a perception that uh, the current system is inequitable both from a taxpayer perspective and a student perspective. Um, and AIR, AIR has uh, resoundingly found that that perception is true. Um, so um, be careful in making any statement about the current level of funding statewide being sufficient, because it's not when you get down to um, any number, I won't try to name, name them off, but any number of towns and our challenge is to try to deal with that. And I just have to say that we're not talking about so far anyway, and I don't think we will, redistribution okay. of money from, let's say, Bedford or, or Waterville Valley um, or Portsmouth um, to the places that are, are, falling, are short right now. Um, and you only, the funding that we have is sufficient statewide only if that redistribution occurs. Otherwise, there's got to be some way of addressing that shortfall in those places where there is clearly a shortfall by the standards that we're working to put in place. Um, we've got to find a way to close that shortfall and it's not gonna come, maybe part of it will come from redistribution. I, I think it probably should. But, mm -hmm. uh, but let's be honest, it's, uh, we're short uh, unless we go through a radical redistribution. Okay. So, so that the one question then, Dick, that, that I raised earlier, that what is, what, is meaning, what is a meaningful, bold change? <clears throat> part of that would be that redistribution. I think that's probably... Uh, one way to be bold, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think that was the that was the first um, yeah. first point that we um, that we took up at fiscal policy this morning um, was uh, was that uh, state property tax um, um, should be remitted to the state treasury and that there shouldn't be any rebates and abatements um, uh, uh, for for taxes. Uh, uh, over and above the cost of adequacy. Jay, I see you just uh, put your face uh, to us. Do you have any comments on that? That means you just finished lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
I think uh, your conversation's right on. I mean, I, I think uh, a differentiated uh, funding, differentiated needs is uh, uh, where so much of our evidence is going. So uh, if that's bold, I mean, I think we've been doing that. We just mm -hmm. haven't been doing it uh, at the levels that have been previously recommended. And over time, it, it's continued to erode. So uh, I think there's a challenge to this coming. Uh, well, it, we, we just need to articulate our principles yeah. uh, and, and deliver that to the legislature for it to do its best job. And I, and I think along with that, uh, which we mentioned as one of the things that we had, one of the themes that we had picked up on was a whole issue of property tax relief. Uh, and I know that, uh, uh, David, again, your group has been looking at a number of different ways <clears throat> to provide that relief. Um, and I think this, this is another important part of this conversation. It's not just a matter of redistribution, but then how do you begin to deal with those who are on <clears throat> fixed incomes or who need some kind of relief and have some kind of a bold new program that would provide that uh, unlike what we have right now, which uh, everybody admits is a, f a fairly marginal program. So I think we've got to keep that, at least in my mind's eye, that's a concomitant kind of a thing. That's another leg of the stool here uh, as, we, uh, as we look at this program. Well, there, so. there were actually, <clears throat> we, we had a very interesting discussion this morning uh, about um, uh, circuit breakers and yeah. um, and it's funny because my background is electrical engineering, so I use the term circuit <laughs> something completely different. But uh, <clears throat> uh, but but both in terms of state property tax, and I think with Dick's suggestion, we ended up um, uh, building in that as a as a key component to uh, to state property tax, having a low moderate. Um, um, uh, property tax relief program, but also as a standalone um, principle as well, um, uh, that it's important to have that and that it apply to not just the state property tax, but also a program that's directed to local um, property taxes okay. as well. That that brings in some you know additional considerations because um, you know how's it funded and stuff like that. But, um, but uh, there was a lot of um, interest and traction on that idea this morning. So, um, so I think that's something that we're gonna have to, in the, in the legislature, you know, explore that probably with, um, with the LBA um, uh, and how to, how to go about estimating and, and enacting something like that. Well, and, and, and one of those component parts is also a tax deferral program, mm -hmm. which, which was interesting to me uh, because I'd not really thought about the tax deferral program because what I didn't understand is that if you have a tax deferral program, you can all, locals can also have a bonding issue against that, that, that deferral program. So well, it's not, that, yeah, that, that's, sorry, I got to, sorry about that. <laughs> you're, you're muted, David. Uh, you know, I know I was just trying to save everybody from the phone ringing. Oh, okay. Um, but, um, um, but um, uh, remind me where we left off. We are talking about the deferral program. The deferral and, program. And being able to bond against yeah. that. Deferral so, program. so, so municipalities actually already have that, uh, have that ability. And, uh, and it's called the elderly um, tax deferral um, uh, program, but it would be up to the individual municipalities to, um, to, you know, you know, to either bond or, you know, take, take liens against the property, uh, create a, you know, some sort of um, instrument where they can uh, collect, where they can, I'm not using the right terms, but, um, but monetize those, um, those liens. And, um, and it, it's just so complex to do at a one by one municipal level uh, mm -hmm. being able to organize and manage that at one point from the state level uh, uh, would, would, would make those programs, I think, much more uh, uh, actionable for 
for municipalities and for for um, uh, for homeowners. So uh, uh, so that that would also be a pretty pretty big change to um, to what we've got on the books right yeah. now. Okay, so so we've got those seven themes that we've talked about. Is there anything else that we need to add to those themes? Carrie, is this helpful for you as you begin to uh, look at the thematic issues here? Yes, I would say, and Sarah's here here too. And um, we're you know we're finishing up the survey report. We realize we, it's been a while since we distributed in July, but I think. This conversation is also helpful as we finish that because it's it's very much in line with the findings, okay. and and I and I think that um, those seven points I would I would confirm that that's also what we're seeing. So it's a nice confirmation among many people, which we always like to see. Um, and but I I think also taking some time to think about what are some of the unique perspectives that came out that maybe weren't across. Um, each group. So, um, and um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I had another thought, but I, I lost it. Uh, Sarah, did you want to add anything based on what you've heard and what we're seeing, or um, good to listen? And I'm no, keep... yeah, that's that's great. I agree. I definitely do think that there's uh, value to also highlighting different opinions or ideas, especially when one group really gravitated towards a certain issue and brought that up a lot and others didn't. Um, and hopefully we can kind of get at some of that in some of these um, reports and, and pull that out a little bit. Um, so that's helpful to think about. Yeah. I, I, th I think one of the um, unique uh, inputs, not surprising, but when we had the student input, one of the things that I think they really emphasize was the issue of having enough staff to provide the alternative programs that would give them greater opportunities for uh, their education. Because with a, limited, with a limited number of staff, you've got a limited number of curriculum offerings. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the conversation that we had with the students that, that compared their school with Pinkerton. Mm -hmm. And uh, the they were very clear on this. They love their teachers. They view their teachers as a way of their access to a different world for them. Mm -hmm. And without having the number of, and this goes back to the issue that we talked earlier about qualified staff and maintenance of those staff. And I think that was one of the things that really stood out for me. I mean, it's so obvious, but I think they really saw that as a, a major inequity in their opportunities to have uh, an equal opportunity for their particular education. Mm -hmm. so. And that was brought up a lot um, in the employee, the school employee survey as well, which right. makes sense, you know, yeah. teachers and other staff looking around saying, hey, I have to, you know, be taking care of or, you know, looking after a higher number of students in my class than these other schools, um, you know, or I don't have an aide to assist me um, with this group of students or things like that. Okay. So anything else on the, on the thematic issues? Uh, Mel, did my uh, ears rung when uh, I was hearing about uh, uh, accountability and uh, uh, two things that I, I heard. Uh, one, the lack of accountability uh, measures, indicators for uh, teacher turnover and uh, uh, salaries. And th th it's just not a part of the model right now. And, and then the other uh, is the uh, uh, adequacy of the staffing at the Department of Education to yeah. continue to uh, find uh, it help uncover uh, uh, more accountability measures uh, and and take take that on. I mean, it came up in fiscal policy today. Yeah. It's going to come up in adequacy again. Yeah. It, one of our work groups needs to pull that that constant the, the various thoughts around accountability and uh into into a single thought it's got a couple of suggestions 
and I'm not sure which of our work groups is going to do that, but it, it, you know, it would be an interesting uh, principle maybe to come from uh, the uh, communications work group because uh, it is a public perception that, yeah. Well, what, one, thing, one thing that hasn't come up, and maybe I, I may have missed this, but one thing that I haven't heard is, is okay, you talk about student outcomes. You got tests, you got graduation, you got uh, a daily attendance. Well, what is the standard? I mean, who says this is the um, test level that we're looking at? Who says this is the um, attendance level? This is the graduation level. Who, who creates the baseline for that being the standard that we're gonna be looking for. I've not heard that question in the conversations yet. I've heard the general, the general conversation around that, but the specifics of that and the creation of who determines those specifics, I've not heard that yet, unless I've missed missed that part of the conversation. We've dealt with the generality of what we're talking about, but not the specifics of that. And that leads back to Jay's comment about once that is determined, then who monitors that? And that was a query that I raised today in the fiscal committee was, do we have the capacity to even do that? Mary's shaking her head and she wants to say something. Uh, you're, uh, uh, yeah. If you remember when the New Hampshire Education Improvement um, Law was passed, and Corrine will remember this very well, yep. there were all those things in place. There were standards that were to be met, and there were expectations. Now, a lot of it was part of um, ESEA, but it was something that we had local education improvement plans. And right. all that over the years has, has seemed to just slip away. Um, and right now we don't see any emphasis and we talk about a growth model. And I think most of us years in education would like to see some kind of a, a targeted plan in place for school districts to say, um, we're here, but we wanna get here. And these are the steps we're gonna take. And I'd love to see something like that. I mean, it would go along with an education, um, kind of an overhaul, because I think we've, we've fallen away from those things that we used to do. And a lot of it is because there's no capacity at the DOE. They have no, um, no content people. They have no testing people. They have nobody collecting the data like we used to collect. Remember, we had all these things in place at one point in time. The other thing I just quickly want to mention is Massachusetts. And I think if you recall in the presentation that they did for us, um, and this goes back to your public engagement, the, um, the piece around the energy across the state of Massachusetts for education as a means to building a strong economy. And that's something that I didn't see in the survey results. I didn't see an energy across the state for educational improvement or more funding for education. And I think that's something that Massachusetts has really used. And there's a commitment because of that, that um, emphasis on education. Sorry to talk so much. No, 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 this, this, this relates to the whole issue of the workforce development, Mary. Yeah. And, and, and how that workforce development is um, is equal throughout, or at least there's greater equity throughout the state in the creation of that workforce. But you're also you're also indicating that I think that as we move down to what I what I hope we move to, and that is this whole student centered approach to the funding of schools, that there is a role that the department plays, and I mean this is this is the balance between local decision making. And state, that's where the partnership comes in. Yep. And, and right now, I think, as Mary has indicated, because of the lack of capacity and lack of resources at the department, that's a problem that, they, that, that we've got to be aware of that if we're going to move down to the student-centered approach, there is a concomitant factor here of the role of the Department of Education is going to play in that. And that's one of the concerns I've had with their lack of engagement in this whole process that we've been going through. Right. Um, and that's something that we need to have a briefing with the department on that 
uh, which we've talked about having to do. So, so Mel, I think I think something that's important to that um, to that uh, discussion to what Jay brought up in terms of accountability, and I hope um, you know the adequacy group this afternoon will be able to continue in that you know in the on the accountability discussion, building on what we what we talked about this morning, but um, but. You know, and th I, I think this is probably clear to everybody. But I've had some conversations with, um, with uh, as 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 the commission obviously has with school leaders across the state. One of the things I heard in Newcastle was that if it can't be done, if, if anybody can do it, Newcastle can do it. I heard that. I wonder if the same. I wonder if the um, the same's true in uh, in Berlin. <laughs> yeah. You know, and 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 I'm, I'm you know, and, and I say because we've got Kareen here, and you know, I don't think the um, the 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 superintendent in in Berlin is is you know not getting the job done or or doesn't care right. about the students or anything like that, um, but they just don't have the flexibility of well, if anybody can do it, you know, um, uh, you know, Newcastle can do it. Um, and, um, you know, so when it comes to accountability, uh, it's, it's, and this came up in fiscal policy this morning, you know, it's not like you, you march in there and replace the superintendent as, as some states do, because I don't think that's what the, um, what the limitation is. Um, I want to bring up, you know, we're talking about some more like a unique, I mean, there, that's a relative term here. Um, or, or inputs beyond the the broader themes we talked about at the beginning, and and I'm hearing a few of them that I, that also have risen in my mind looking through the different uh, pieces of engagement evidence um, and and responses and comment and people's experiences and their stories is um, so I'm going to kind of tie it into a bow a little bit of um, so so this idea of um, you know what student outcomes and performance in terms of career and, and college readiness. So what's their future? What's their outcome? Okay, and that, that wraps into equity um, for the state. And you know what I mean? We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, and then also this kind of this shifting in education. So whereas as we're talking about an outcomes-based model or models, um, predicted costs, um, something that's on the mind of educators and I think on the minds of people is um, brought up by students, um, brought up by educators, brought up by others is this um, this kind of shift in education. So so some people will talk about competency-based education. It is a different way of measuring. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different way of constructing programs. Um, it's a it's a shift in, in the materials that need to be used, you know, a shift in technology, students uniqueness and wanting to be prepared for the jobs that that we don't even know exist yet. Um, and, and so there's this where we look at funding at a certain level beyond kind of these these inputs, there is this this package of learning that that educators are grappling with. And it also aligns with student needs, which we've talked quite a bit about. Um, ELL, you know, we're in a global society. People need to be multi-bilingual. Um, and also this, this thinking about, um, you know, what are the social, emotional, mental health needs of students as well? And, and, and schools are transforming. You know, there's, there's um, a, this thought among it, and, educators based on you know what we've been we kind of saw in the survey as well is is um how to account for these these changing needs or I don't know if they're changing they're just maybe they're they're more in the open now or I, I don't have enough to um let's just sit with their mental behavioral social emotional needs that exist for students and, and that's part of this equity conversation so there's this um yeah, we just those are things that continually come up, you know, and we we've kind of counted it um, in the GSP, uh, you know, the Grand State Poll, we've counted it in the survey. We've brought out these themes, but it, it's on people's minds in, in terms of um, 
this conversation. So uh, I just rested in a little bit as, as another perspective that is present in these, activi these activities. I don't have an answer or response other than that. I just want to put it in there. Okay, good. All right. I, Mel? Yeah, Dick? Just want to, I guess, follow up on something you said. Um, and you, you talked about um, this outbreak output-based um, approach that we're walking towards uh, in determining what is an adequate public education. And, uh, and you asked, um, well, how are we going to know that the output is the right output? I think you asked something like that. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, and uh, I wondered if that that reflects some unease in our starting point here. We we are we've EC, uh, AIR has worked up this formula based on a starting point, which is you know New Hampshire's performance mm -hmm. relative to all other states. We're at the average performance level, and then um, they've worked off of that, um, as I understand it anyway. So that. Uh, that outcome measure, that factor score, is um, graduation rates, attendance rates, and some testing scores, as I understand it. Um, and we're building a lot on top of that. Can we really rely on that? Well, I think I think that's 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 the question, um, and, and you know, and I think um, I think the one of the the issues, and, and Carrie kind of addressed this a bit, and that is in two in two in two thousand eight, when the current system was created, that we weren't dealing with the performance base, we weren't dealing with competency base. Uh, you know, it was it was fairly easy to identify the component parts of what I call things mm -hmm. that go into providing for a school district. But I think over the over the last twelve years, that's the system of how we educate students has been modified. And Carrie addressed some of the some of the components of that. The, the query that, that you're raising, Dick, which is one that's in my mind's eye too, is that what's the threshold benchmark? Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether, uh, I've not looked at all of the ARAR data in its intimacy, but is there a threshold benchmark for an SAT score, for example? Is there a threshold benchmark for, um, Dealing with um, uh, okay, with, with, I found with, this on the web. Excuse me, uh, <laughs> uh, threshold for student attendance. There's a threshold for a percent of graduation. I'm not sure AIR has um, created that platform yet. Some of you that have looked at that data, perhaps uh, Jay, you guys have in your adequacy, might have looked at that a little more specifically. But once, once, that, once the threshold benchmarks are created, then we go back to Mary's issue. And that is, okay, who's gonna moderate yeah. those da that data? So that if a school district is not meeting that threshold benchmark or has started at the benchmark, but moved beyond below the benchmark, what happens then? And this, I think, goes back to then the question, which we've not had, and that is the issue of the accountability. I mean, we just right now we say everybody gets four thousand dollars, no problem, mm -hmm. without really understanding what that means. Where does it go for? What's the priorities in the district? What we're talking about here, this is the bold part of this thing. What we're trying to say here is that there's a different way of looking at the funding of schools which provides a greater accountability on how students perform. 
not what the bottom line is in this particular school district, whether they met their budget and whether or not they had some left over. The question is, how did it go to impact kids learning? That's the bold move here. Yeah. And, and yet, in order to do that from a theoretical standpoint, you have to have some practical application of how that's going to be monitored, what happens if school schools fall below that threshold benchmark. That's the question that we haven't dealt with. And I'm not sure the commission can deal with that. That's an issue perhaps that's a policy question that the legislature needs to deal with. But those are some of the things that are in my mind and because I believe in what we're the, the, the way we're going, but I'm also beginning to think about what the impl implications is that down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would just add to that, that the old system or the current law system is really quite easy yes. to um, enforce, uh, yeah. just like the Dover lawsuit, where where they all they needed to say in that lawsuit was that the state was not providing the funding that, that the adequacy formula called for. They had set caps in place, and uh, so um, so that was easy. It was resolved. Yeah. A little, little more money. Yeah. Um, but when we get into an output-based formula, in the first instance, we as legislators are gonna to have to write a law that defines that starting point. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we have to write in a, a way in which that gets changed, evolves over time as understandings change and tests change and whatever else or more data becomes available. And um, all of that has to be written in a way that is in at least some sense measurable. Otherwise you can't do anything with it. So it's a big challenge. It's much messier, oh, yeah. more complex and difficult than a, numbers, uh, a number that tells you whether it's okay or not okay. It's more than just writing a check. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, just going back to the accountability piece, there hasn't been any for quite a while, not even for school approval process, unfortunately, but schools always, always were, the goals were always to have your students achieve to at least a state average. And if you could hit the state average, you were doing really good, but there was never any motivation to do that, just be state average. And then graduation rate is a set percentage, I believe that the state has. So maybe an additional cost that, that is recommended out of the commission is to tie in accountability for an adequacy system. Uh, the closest thing that comes to that is schools who, who have Title I funds have much stricter guidance and oversight. And they're required to write improvement plans if there isn't enough student growth in the reading and the math or whatever your Title I program is. Um, and the state is very involved in the Title I ROM because it seems to be a tighter and more progressive system. Um, but if you don't have Title I and you really, you know, then you don't have anything else. I mean, mm. it's, I think 2014 was the last time that we went through an accountability process for school approval. So, I mean, that's additional cost to the state. So yeah. there's your additional revenue. You know, if you're going to, you know, as a group, we say, well, you've got to have people that can check on these student outcomes to make sure the districts are spending the dollars where they need to spend them rather than buying something that is over and above the average just because you want it. Um, and maybe that's the part on the financial piece, you know, that going to require revenue because it's we don't we don't have those support systems now and if it's going to make or break you know the new formula if it's a piece of it which it, it sounds like it needs to be if adequacy is a part of it and we're going to hold student outcomes as the top of the plate then there has to be that. monitoring for that yeah. Mary, it looks like you wanted to say something. I just here. wanted to add that there, um, Corrine mentioned Title I and 
there is funding. All those people of the Department of Ed actually are funded by Title I funds. And right. they're the ones who go out and do the accountability assessments. One, yep. one thing I wanted to mention, though, that I don't think we should forget in this conversation is the PACE program. And across a number of school districts, they do have the PACE program going on, which is kind of an integrated learning and assessment process. Yep. And that seems to be functioning uh, um, apart from the Department of Ed, almost parallel to it. I, I know that Paul Lev is working on it and there are a number of others. Corrine probably is mm -hmm. much more familiar than I am, but it seems that that has a lot of merit and, and a worth a, a look at to see where they are in place and time. Because right now, effectively, the Department of Ed is completely dysfunctional in terms of their role with public schools. <laughs> and I, I say that with all due respect because I know they are short funded and short personnel, but it just seems that they've turned their back on the needs of our public schools. Mm -hmm. Well, PACE is one of those grant funded programs that funding has been decreased over the years. So more districts, you know, it's not sustainable. I've heard it's wonderful. It did not participate in it. You know, we went after Project AWARE grant money probably seven, eight years ago. So you could provide social emotional uh, support to kids. Now that's a given, but the money's gone. So how do you continue to provide social service work and mental health work in your schools when the grant's gone, but yet it's needed more than ever? So, you know, grant, big grant, projects are great. I mean, that was the only way we could get teacher training and a variety of needed materials to move forward, but we never could sustain it. Okay. All right. So it's been a good conversation. So we, so we have our seven major themes that we talked about, and yep. we can re report those back uh, to the uh, commission. Just on Monday. Um, let's, let's look at... Um, the issue I know that Carrie has also been working on one of our one of our tasks is to deal with the public outreach, and she's in, we had a chance to look at the draft of uh, of our what we call our Rotary uh, presentation, um, and the, the one of the queries that we had today was who should we be focusing on to receive. Um, this valuable information knowing full well that one of the things we have found is that most people don't have a clue as it relates to how all this stuff works and yet we're talking about some doing something that may be a, a, a benefit because if they don't know what's going on we can then say well here's what we want to do <laughs> and and give some new information so the, some of the things that i was looking at from a standpoint of people who should receive this briefing would be, let me just give you my, what's on my list, all right? Mm -hmm. I've got uh, the Bureau and uh, the Bureau of uh, the BIA. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did find out from our conversation with um, uh, the Massachusetts folks is that the business community is very key in looking at this. Uh, the other group, which would be a similar to that, would be the um, Business and Education Coalition, which is the Tom Raffio group that has a, it's a very eclectic group that cuts across education, business, a really very, a real variety of different people. Uh, clearly, um, the DOE needs to be briefed on this. Uh, the Superintendents need to be briefed, as well as the business managers need to be briefed. You also have, I think, uh, the SPED coordinators uh, out there. They need to understand how this, how this is going to be done. We have the, um, the school boards association. I'm, I believe that there is a city managers organization of some sort. I don't know the name of it but it takes into all of the city city managers. Yeah. Is it through the municipal uh, association? And probably, yeah, right, yeah. Um, we have, um, I think there are a series of editorial boards across the state that we need to meet with and try to explain this to them. 
Um, we have, uh, I, and again, I don't know who this is, but there are a series of minority groups across the state. I know there's a statewide NAACP group. Uh, we, we heard from the ELL teachers. There may be a, a, a particular uh, uh, Spanish speaking a gr a minority group that we need to talk with. You've got the Fair School Funding Group, which has been intimately involved in talking about this, but I think we need to have a, a conversation with them. So those, those were the you know, eight or nine or 10 groups that just out of my head. Um, I think some of the higher education, although we're talking about public schools, K-12, yeah. there is, uh, there's a piece of the higher education piece that I think would also be interested in this too. Uh, Susan, you had your hand up. Yeah, I would like to add to your list of uh, the Chambers of Commerce, because not everybody is in the BIA, but between the two groups, we would hit them. And then um, welcoming New Hampshire, which is a, a big uh, immigrant education group, and also EVNH, Economic Vitality New Hampshire, which attracts uh, many of the people of color who are in businesses right now. Good, 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 good. Okay. I wondered about county commissioners. Others. Um. Well, you didn't mention NEA, but they've been very vocal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David, anything, any, anybody come to mind to you, Dave? What about career and technical ed, um, ROM? I mean, there is there is that group, yeah, the, the group the that, that, that Val's on, and uh, yeah, it's PTAC, and, yeah. I think. Yep, yeah, I've served on that before. Is there a, any kind of united PTA across the state? I don't know how active it is. I, 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 I think thinking. that's a good point. We that's one we need to look at. Right. There isn't. There wasn't. Else. Yeah. There was a New Hampshire Partners in Education. Um, well, I haven't been involved in that in a long, long time. So I don't know if that still exists. It used to promote volunteerism in schools, and it was a statewide organization. New Hampshire Partners in Education. Now this is um, to prepare to go out and educate people about the commission's work yep. after the report is submitted to the legislation. Yep. Yep. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, these they were just trying to get a list of potential yep. folks that uh, obviously some some of, and some of these folks have been involved in the conversation, so it's a yes. matter of. Um, but my, my concern, like for example, with the Scoop and Tennis Association, you know, we need to, to go beyond just the advocates for that organization right. uh, and meet either with their board or whomever, whomever they think should hear the message. Yeah. Mel, on, this, yeah. on the CTE uh, uh, group, there are there's the legislatively constituted group uh which has you know a mix of backgrounds including uh val who represents industry and a few legislators but the there is another group that has the 28 cte directors or principals uh that yeah. come together on a periodic basis uh, and I, I just, uh, that's just a refinement to the suggestion that I think uh, as an audience, that might be a more thorough. Now, 
we didn't met it, may, we didn't mention legislators, but at some point, oh, you're muted, Mel. You're muted. Yeah. Mel, you're muted there. <laughs> didn't hear a thing. <clears throat> Unless he's having another conversation. No, no. <laughs> no, David's trying to set that up now with the legislators, and there's a series of orientation of the of the new legislature after the election that takes place between that in December and between December and we start our work in in January. That he's trying to find out when we can get on the agenda to do something with them. So uh, that's a given. Okay. Any, any, uh, anything else regarding um, the groups uh, that we might want to identify? Well, I wonder if some other commission members might yeah. think of some think that. Some I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll list this, we'll get this list, Gary, yeah. uh, up and share that with the group and then obviously be open to uh, other input from them too, because they obviously bring with them a, a rich resource too. Um, and so what I've done with the conversation, um, Mel and Crean and others, you may have a more succinct version than I do. Succinctness is not always my forte. Uh, but what I've done is I've created a Google Doc. And so I will share the link with this group. And we'll just um, add to it. And you can edit. You can make comments. Uh, you can add to it. I think I've captured and, and Jordan uh, has been taking meeting minutes. So that's an also a great reference, a cross reference as well. Um, and so I'll share that link uh, 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 later on today so people can look into that. So we're ready to um, uh, share out what we're thinking. I think it's a nice, what, what we have today is, is a really nice um, outline for the report. I'm, I'm hearing questions we want to ask. Uh, implications for decisions based on public input. So I think uh, we have a nice beginning of an outline here, and we're able to say, you know, what what all the what all of our efforts were, what else we want to do, what else we recommend doing. Questions and then major themes and kind of unique points that may not be points under this commission's charge, but are points that need to be considered in policy anyway. So I think we've really kind of rounded out. What needs to be said here from my perspective, uh, my humble, my humble perspective. Good. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think that is the agenda for today. Correct, Carrie? That is correct, Mel. No. Yes, it's good. This is, I'm always checking with my left and right <laughs> hand so arm here. So, <laughs> so uh, oh, Sarah, well. do you have do you have anything to add or anything? No, no, that's great. This is definitely very helpful as we okay, look okay. forward to right. writing it all up. David, any any other comments? No, I think it's uh, I think it's good. I think uh, from the conversation today, you can see how um, all of this is starting to merge together. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, folks. Well, good. this is good. Right. Thanks, thanks so much. And, all right. Um, we'll see you. Three o'clock. Don't right forget on. three o'clock. All right. Bye. 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 All right. Okay. Bye, everyone.